The following episode can be viewed on the YouTube channel Bernie or Bust Television. Good morning, USA, and welcome to another episode of the Bernie or Bust Show. It's full steam ahead to Super Tuesday, and we're ready for a stunning victory. Most of the news I'm focused on right now is about how the establishment is reacting and how their suck-up cronies are reacting to Bernie's success. Boxes even began in Nevada. Establishment Democrats were readying a new wave of Russiagate attacks on the Senate. But as Rolling Stone's Matt Taibbi told us on Thursday, that strategy might backfire on the Democrats yet again. Yeah, I think the remarkable thing about this story is the degree to which they appear to genuinely think it's going to work. Um, you know, the, this this story very unsubtly was, you know, it came out in the Washington Post the day before the caucus. It was so obvious that even Sanders, who's been kind of shaky on this issue, he, even he had to point it out. But they thought, clearly somebody thought this was going to have an impact on the caucus, and it was a blowout of, like, historic proportions. Uh, you know, this coupled with the, the rising approval ratings of Trump, uh, you know, who's gotten like a six point bump since the latest iteration of Russiagate came out. Uh, it, I mean, I don't know how much more evidence they need that people just don't really care about this issue. Here's a little bit more on Russiagate. Joe Biden is intending to beat this dead horse all the way into Milwaukee, I think. Biden's campaign, for example, slammed Bernie, saying his Castro comments were part of, quote, a larger pattern throughout his life to embrace autocratic leaders and governments across the world. Joe Biden is saying Bernie Sanders likes dictators too much. The same Joe Biden who himself cozied up to dictators in Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Jordan, Egypt. In fact, Biden as vice president refused to call Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak a dictator, even in the midst of the Arab Spring, at the very moment Mubarak's security forces were attacking protesters. I, I would not refer to him as a dictator. Wow. Then there's Michael Bloomberg, Mayor Bloomberg, whose campaign launched a thread making up quotes from Bernie praising dictators and even a hashtag since deleted called Bernie on despots. Yes, the same Michael Bloomberg seen here yucking it up with his special guest, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia in a New York Starbucks, is now giving lectures on standing up to despots and dictators. Then again, Michael Bloomberg, like Joe Biden, has a habit of denying dictators are even dictators. Xi Jinping is not a dictator. He has to satisfy his constituents or he's not going to survive. And he's not a dictator? No, he has to. He has a constituency to, uh, to, to, to uh, um, uh, answer to. Sorry, what? Bloomberg, Biden, these are the people who are going to tell us that Sanders is in bed with dictators. Seriously. Well, how about Team Trump? Are they going to weaponize Bernie's positive words from the past about social programs in the USSR or literacy rates in communist Cuba? Well, maybe they should first have a word with their boss, who has said he is literally in love with the world's worst communist, the world's worst dictator, Kim Jong-un. He wrote me beautiful letters, and they're great letters. Great. They're great. We fell in love. A president who went sword dancing with the Saudi royals on his first official trip abroad, who called the Egyptian president Abdul Fattah al-Sisi my favorite dictator, oh who said to the unelected president of China, I want to thank you again. You're a very special man. And don't even get me started on the Trump-Putin bromance. But it's not just Trump. Here's Barack Obama bowing to the Saudi king. Here's Hillary Clinton with the late Mubarak, who she called a friend of her family. And here's John Kerry having an intimate private dinner with Bashar al-Assad. So look, don't buy the crap that the media and top Democrats and cynical Republicans are trying to sell you about Sanders. Frankly, they're all charlatans and hypocrites. Because the irony is that Bernie Sanders is the only candidate running for president who has given an entire speech about the importance of fighting authoritarianism and tyranny around the world by building a global democratic movement to counter it. Authoritarians seek power by promoting division and hatred. We will promote unity, inclusion, and love. That clip from The Intercept is very good because it doesn't favor Democrats or Republicans. If you don't like despots, tyrants, and dictators, then Bernie is your guy. Here's a Medium article called Why Trump Fears Bernie by Francis Taylor. Recently, as part of the whole impeachment Michigas, a private conversation between Donald Trump and several donors has leaked onto the internet. 
The audio recording involves Trump bumbling through various topics from the Ukraine to the European Union to marijuana, but it's his discussion of the 2016 election that warrants special attention. Turning to this subject, he admits he would have had a much tougher time running against Hillary Clinton had she chosen Bernie Sanders as her vice president. He was the only one I didn't want her to pick, he confided to his fellows, citing Sanders' free trade skepticism as the main reason. No doubt some of this is true. As Stephen L. Morgan notes in a study he conducted with Jiwon Lee, the six million voters who jumped ship from Obama to Trump tended to view free trade as a greater threat to jobs and wages in comparison to diehard Republicans and Democrats. If you've been following this show, you understand that the Bernie or Trump voters in the swing states in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania denied Hillary the presidency. In polling, Bernie Sanders is trouncing the other Democratic candidates in those states, and I think Trump is becoming aware of it. Back to the article. Furthermore, a Sanders vice presidency would have undermined Trump's divide and conquer tactics. The Donald was quick to frame Clinton's nomination as part of a rigged primary contest, hoping to alienate Sanders supporters from the Democrats. To their credit, most of them didn't turn, <laughs> to their credit, but there were still enough voters who pivoted from Sanders to Trump, for whatever reason, in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania to cost the Democrats the election. With Sanders as her VP, Clinton might have mitigated some of the damage. Dear viewers and listeners, lest you misconstrue my um, smirking there, I do not necessarily believe it was to anyone's credit to vote for Hillary Clinton. If you hadn't gotten that impression from me thus far, I just wanted to make that clear here. Okay, back to the article. Now, as the 2020 election approaches, Trump is attempting the same gambit again. But it will work only if Sanders loses the Democratic primary. And with the Vermont senator surging in the polls, this outcome appears a lot less likely. As Ryan Grimm of The Intercept reports, it seems that Donald Trump is only just now grappling with the possibility of a Sanders nomination. January marked the only month where Trump mentioned a Democratic nominee, Sanders, in stump speeches more frequently than frontrunner Joe Biden. His campaign has recently sent out emails about Sanders leading a socialist invasion, and as of late, the president has made him a more frequent target of his tweets. Timed so closely to one another, these developments suggest that Sanders now occupies a sizable lot in Trump's head. So let's keep Bernie there, right in Trump's head, making him have nightmares. Here's a wonderful Medium article by Reagan Davis entitled, The Ungodly Privilege of Vote Blue No Matter Who. This has been circulating for a while, but I went back to it, and I think it's been updated. I'm not sure, but it's a very good read, and so I want to share some of the key points with you. In the fall of 2018, when Indiana was debating whether or not to re-elect Senator Joe Donnelly, I had a discussion with a friend at a party explaining that I was likely going to abstain from voting in the senatorial race because I did not feel either candidate had earned my vote. She replied, that's a pretty privileged position, don't you think? In the moment, I laughed it off and moved on, but as the first Democratic presidential debate looms, I've started to hear this argument growing in prominence once again. To someone whose core issue is some domestic social problem like hate crime bills or abortion access, it makes sense to believe anyone who isn't out voting for every single Democrat on the ticket must be so privileged that they cannot see the difference between right and left. That perspective, however, is not only incorrect, but in and of itself rooted in immense socioeconomic and political advantages. It isn't that leftists are so privileged our lives won't change no matter who wins. It's that moderates are so privileged that they can rely on any centrist Democrat to make their lives better. If my main concern is press freedom for whistleblowers, Donald Trump and Pete Buttigieg are indistinguishable to me. If I care about prison reform, what's the difference between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris? The education policy of Cory Booker and Donald Trump are virtually the same. I can't tell the difference between where Joe Biden and Donald Trump stand on foreign policy. These examples are some of the issues which truly affect the world's most disadvantaged, the non-American, non-white, non-wealthy human beings around the globe. By voting blue no matter who, I am telling the Democratic Party that it does not have to worry about such issues or such people. I am sending the message that as long as one pays lip service to my reproductive rights, puts queer people in a commercial, or says the wall wouldn't properly keep all those horrible illegal immigrants out, they have done enough. 
And as a white person, despite being queer and female, my life would probably not change. It might even get better. If she does update this article, it would be interesting to read her take on the differences between Mike Bloomberg's policies and Donald Trump's. However, can I really then say that I care for my fellow women while I endorse a government that kills them en masse in Yemen? Can I truly argue that I fight for other queer folks when the party I signed my name for still deports them back to countries where their lives are in danger? Can I say I am an ally to black Americans while I vote for someone whose policies will do nothing to fight their mass incarceration? Glossing over such realities and demanding that others fall in line regardless of who wins the party's nomination so you can rest easy with the knowledge that the pig is now wearing a thick coat of lipstick is the epitome of privilege. As it stands, I feel there are about four or five Democrats who have earned my vote, and if they win the election, I will happily cast my ballot for them. I would like to hear what she says now if there are four or five now. And if there are, I would like to hear her rationale for why she could support them. I'm hoping, based on how articulate and sensible this article is, that she would say there's only one candidate left for whom I could cast my vote. Then she goes on to say, it could change, and I wonder if it has, but as of today, that's it. To me, these are the compromises. None of them are perfect. I disagree with just about all of them on gun control. I worry they are disingenuous about wanting to divest from the war economy, and none of them are as strong on labor rights as I would like. That's fair. On top of these disagreements, I also know that I will always have the option to cast my ballot for the Green Party candidate, someone I know I could feel proud of were they to win, and who I trust unconditionally to enact an agenda I support. If I vote blue despite all that, you can be sure that I am giving up all of the ground I can without losing my morals. So when someone tells me to vote blue no matter who, they essentially say that not only are they incapable of distinguishing between the 20 plus candidates currently running for president, and I don't care to, but that they cannot conceive of someone who sees progressive candidates as the middle ground. The phrase itself gives away that its advocates do not have a full image of the political spectrum in their minds and as such can only think to criticize based on false assumptions. In the United States, we teach folks from a young age that the political spectrum exists between right and left and that the Democratic Party is as good as it ever gets for the left side. Instead of educating each other about comprehensive ideologies, we talk about issues and emphasize those upon which Democrats and Republicans disagree. It can seem as though the spectrum is wide ranging, but in reality, most folks fall outside of it, both ideologically and because most Americans don't vote. Why is it a leftist job to continue over and over to compromise their morals when they could so easily once again join that majority of people who leave the ballot blank or stay home? Why is it not the job of the candidate to convince leftists to vote for them? Isn't that the whole point of a campaign? I'll close with her last paragraph because I've noticed a lot of people are really frustrated with Elizabeth Warren. There's a hashtag trending on Twitter that asks her to drop out. So here's the last paragraph. And if you like this article, please go back and read it. When a candidate decides to waffle in the middle of our already conservative political spectrum, that is said candidate's decision. Vote blue no matter who Democrats had just better hope the ensuing lost working class votes are accounted for in the candidate's cost benefit analysis. Who knows, perhaps the party truly will pick up two moderate Republicans when they say they want to build a different kind of wall or sign bills into law that ban abortion. Either way, I will no longer sit by and allow my votes for foreign wars, economic inequality, and horrendous immigration policies to weigh on my conscience because it was the lesser of two evils. There is a world where neither candidate is evil. The Democrats just need to learn they can no longer get away with being evil in the first place. Here's another pithy article by Caitlin Johnstone, Intelligent Sources. All candidates are Russian agents but Pete Buttigieg. Satire warning. Today's Caitlin Johnstone essay has been replaced by this breaking report by the National News Conglomerate, NNC. 
obey. Following shocking reports from the New York Times and the Washington Post that Moscow is simultaneously working to both re-elect Donald Trump and ensure the nomination of Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders in the Democratic presidential primary race, NNC has obtained further information confirming that nearly all candidates currently running for president are in fact covert agents of the Russian government. Yesterday we had an article from the Washington Post that I shit you not, said according to sources familiar with the matter. So Caitlin is probably picking up on that. According to sources familiar with the matter, the lone candidate not literally conducting espionage on behalf of the Russian government is Pete Buttigieg, the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Intelligence has revealed that Mr. Buttigieg is at this time the only candidate who we can count on not to place our nation's interests square in the hands of Vladimir Putin. An anonymous source in the Central Intelligence Agency told NNC on Saturday. In fact, Mr. Buttigieg is the only candidate running with the skill, the experience, and the multilingual relatability needed to bridge our nation's deep divisions and bring Americans together in this time of uncontrolled hostility, the CIA source continued. Because in truth, the unity of our togetherness is in the freedom of our democracy, added the source. The long and winding road to the American flag was built upon the steps of our founding fathers. You don't have to be a big shot Washington insider to see that the problems our nation faces are tearing us apart at our own peril with radical divisive rhetoric saying you need to burn down the establishment and voice a concrete foreign policy position. And that's why I for one believe we don't have to choose between revolution and the status quo. We can come together and find solutions that help the working class and billionaires. Experts say these new revelations on Russian election interference should consume 100% of all news coverage for the entirety of 2020 and that Democrats should definitely spend all their time from now until November focusing solely on President Trump's suspicious ties to the Russian government. I can't think of a single thing that could possibly go wrong if Democrats focused exclusively on the possibility that the president conspired with Vladimir Putin in the lead up to the election in November, said Les Overton of the influential think tank Americans for an American America. If Democrats want to prevent another four years of Trump, they should hit him where they know it hurts. Non-stop 24-7 Russia conspiracy theories. That's what Americans really care about. Asked if it's possible that undue emphasis on Russian collusion could prove a fruitless endeavor given Trump's soaring approval rating after impeachment resulted in his acquittal and the Mueller report failed to indict a single American for conspiring with the Russian government, Overton disagreed and said this time will be, like, totally different. Democrats should definitely invest all of their mental and emotional energy in this Trump-Russia scandal because this time it's a sure thing, Overton said. Put all your eggs in this basket and get your hopes up very, very high. The big boom is coming any minute now, I promise. Overton then departed with an envelope full of cash, which he said was his life savings, reportedly to invest in lottery tickets. Then we go to another article that I swear could have been written by Caitlin Johnstone in satire mode. It's by Charles P. Pierce, who is, I'm telling you, a real person. I'm almost sure a real person who sounds just as satirical as Caitlin Johnstone. So this guy is not trying to be funny, I promise. Bernie Sanders has surrounded himself with people so utterly pure in their own opinion of themselves that they object to compromises that they themselves made. You don't have to be Nostradamus to watch the frenzied raving of the Bernie Kratz over the past three days and not see clearly a warm summer's day in Milwaukee on which a massive tantrum inevitably monkey wrenches the Democratic National Convention. I think it's pretty weird to call it a tantrum. Would you call a riot in the streets in Milwaukee a tantrum? It's just a tantrum, like a four-year-old would do. I don't think it's going to look like a tantrum. Not long ago, I got in touch with someone who is a Bernie fan who also was part of the party's deliberations after the 2016 election. These discussions were designed to address complaints by a number of people regarding the nominating process, including the role of the superdelegates, which never were a great idea, but which in the fevered brains of the most devout Berniecrats play a role somewhere between the Daily Machine and the Bavarian Illuminati. Anyway, this person got back to me with the following text. 
The Bernie folks in the Unity and Reform Commission did get some good frameworks through bringing on board some Clinton folks. We pushed for head count and transparency in caucus votes so any candidate could audit the count. We wanted but failed on the no realignment. For primaries and caucuses, we got the push to allow Indies to change voter registration to the day of if the party controlled the primary and caucus. We had nothing to do with debate rules and process. No DNC member did, actually. That all comes from DNC chairman Tom Perez, not even from other officers. I don't know how you'd interpret that, but that looks like a pretty slimy operation to me. Going on with this message from a burner. Superdelegates were obviously important, and we had three options, and the Rules Committee wrote the final rule on that. We don't get to vote until the second ballot. We only got that passed by forming a coalition within the DNC, the reformers, the establishment, etc. The same thing is going to have to happen in the primary, and this is my fear, that right now no candidate will have the majority of delegates needed, and the attitude of whoever has the most should get it is not what our rules say. This person also expressed a fervent wish that the progressives in the field get together and work something out before the convention gets crazy and nominates Michael Bloomberg. The problem, of course, is that one of those candidates, Bernie Sanders, has surrounded himself with people so utterly pure in their own opinion of themselves that they object to compromises that they themselves made. Consider that over the past couple of days, or ever since a CNN town hall in which Elizabeth Warren pretty much pants a Bernie bro on the very topic, that Sandersland completely lost its mind on this issue. Ha! <laughs> she didn't pants him. I think he skirted her. But that's my opinion. I've shown you the clip on previous Bernie shows. I think even on two different shows. So go back and watch that if you think she pants him. Our erudite and eminently reasonable pundit goes on. These are the facts on the ground. Number one, Bernie Sanders is not a Democrat. He is an independent who quadrennially, oh my effing G, who quadrennially cosplays as a Democrat because he wants to run for president. For this, he should be eternally grateful that A, nobody makes the point that at least Ralph Nader had the stones to be an independent and run as an independent, and B, that he is running now and not back in the days when there really was a democratic establishment that would have been able to crush him like a bug. Oh, I wish we had those days again. Number two, Bernie Sanders and his campaign are running in the Democratic nominating process at the sufferance of the Democratic Party. Not only that, but the campaign is running for the Democratic nomination under a system of rules that they themselves had a hand in drafting and under compromises into which they freely entered. Believe me, after 2016, there are Democrats who believe that nobody in that party owes Bernie Sanders a bean with which to bless himself. I swear I'm not making this up. That system was the product of vigorous and healthy debate. Those compromises were hard won and not unreasonable. They and the work that produced them deserve the most basic respect of agreeing to adhere to them. Number three, that's the way it goes. For the Sanders people to throw around accusations that the man is keeping Bernie down again is to fail to recognize that Bernie is the man this time around, and the prospect they could disrupt the convention if they don't get what they want in violation of the rules that they helped write is the height of hubris, and you can ask Sophocles how that works out. <laughs> Oh my goodness. If you ask me what is the biggest stumbling block in the way of a Sanders nomination, I will tell you that it is a severe case of premature triumphalism among the members of his national staff and God knows among the angry children of the intertubes. Nobody owes Bernie Sanders anything. Nobody owes his campaign any more deference than they owe to the campaigns of any of the other surviving candidates. Only one campaign has people who disrupted the National Convention in 2016. Only one campaign has people threatening to primary other progressive Democrats. And that campaign is the one pushing a candidate who isn't really a Democrat anyway. <laughs> Some Sanders fans have attempted to start a movement to primary Elizabeth Warren. 
But she's so freaking unpopular that I don't think it's going to even take anything to do that. Just saying. Back to the article, if you can call it that. Back to the diatribe. Back to the elitist high chair banging. For example, there is a lot of loose talk out there about primarying Senator Professor Warren. Senator Professor. Senator Professor. Please. The only person remotely capable of mounting that kind of challenge in Massachusetts is Representative Ayanna Presley, who is currently one of Warren's primary surrogates. Suck-ups. Sycophants. I love the degree to which these threats are getting under this guy's skin. And that's not even to mention the kind of presumption it takes for various juice box revolutionaries to make the threat in the first place. Because she told the truth about the fait accompli scam that the Sanders campaign is trying to run based on a fraction of a smidgen of the actual vote. She's a neolib corporate sellout who wants to be Bloomberg's vice president? It sounds like you're both trying to get Bloomberg to be the nominee. A Bloomberg Warren ticket. Are you really serious about that? Do you think a Bloomberg Warren ticket is going to deny Trump the presidency? What you're really saying is that you're so goddamn privileged that it wouldn't matter to you if Trump continued in office. Anyway, Charles, let's go on. It turns out that many of the Bernie stands can be more insufferable in victory than they were in defeat. I say this in all love and Christian fellowship. <laughs> Bernie Sanders and his more fervent followers and many sanctimonious rat fuckers who run this campaign can fuck right off. Speaking of rat fuckers, Charles, how much has the CIA paid you to write this story? That's my new rejoinder, by the way. Anytime we hear people sounding like they're accusing us of being Russian agents, we call them CIA agents. It's the new thing. You should try it. And now let's end this episode with a lovely farewell to Charles giving him what he most fears. The preceding episode can be viewed on the YouTube channel, Bernie or Bust Television. Get on board the Bernie or Bust train. Come get on board the Bernie or Bust train. Once you hear that clickety-clack, there ain't no time for turning back. Oh, get on board.